Today's presentation, we're going to look at icons of the Theotokos, the mother of the Lord. Uh, and we're going to look at a number of them, but more specifically, we're going to look at icons that are recognized as wondrous or wonder-working. These are miracle-working icons. So we have here an image or an icon of St. Luke painting an icon. An icon of an icon. If you look at the icon of the triumph of orthodoxy, it's an icon of people holding up icons. He was the first, uh, or one of the first iconographers. So again, it's a, it's a tradition that goes all the way back to the earliest days of Christianity. This is the earliest dated icon specifically of the Theotokos, and particularly of the Theotokos within an event of the New Testament. So we have an image, an early image. This is from the catacombs of the Virgin Mary. Here we have one of the images that's attributed to St. Luke. Uh, this one is actually a, little, a bit of a relief. You can kind of see a little bit of the, uh, the depth of the image. You can see the Theotokos uh, holding the child. There's the Riza, which we'll, we'll talk a little, little bit more, which is this kind of uh, gold shirt that's put on it, for lack of better words. There's a tradition that when the image started to, to wear, that people would just kind of fix it up a little bit. Right? And as tradition, as time went on, the, the clothing, for example, of the Theotokos began to change to adjust to really what was common in that iconography. Here we have uh, another early, early icon of the Theotokos. You can really see in this image, this early image of the Theotokos, the influence of the Hellenistic art. Here we have another uh, image of St. Luke, of the Theo of Saint Luke having written this icon of the Theotokos, aged, but we have beautifully in this, the Syriza, some of the, again, it's not a real clear image, but Tamata, which is something we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit, as well as different scenes from the life of the Theotokos. Some of these icons, uh, they leave them kind of hanging on the Riza, uh, and some of them, you know, there's so many that they, they really overflow. This is the Porta Itisa. This is the, the icon that I mentioned. Uh, one of the, really one of the most famous icons, uh, one of the most famous icons, it's at the monastery of Eviron on Manathos. Uh, again, you can see some of the, the Tamata. Uh, this, again, the Riza was added to it to protect it. So the, the next series of icons are really neat. These icons depict the story of the icon of the Porta Itisa. Uh, and so the Porta Itisa began, belonged to a noble family. I believe it was in Constantinople. And here we have the, the pious lady. And she had this icon. And at the time of the iconoclasts, the period in which the em emperors and many of the bishops uh, were condemning icons and the reverence of icons, uh, and this is when many of the icons were destroyed. Uh, that's why for most, you know, we think of icons, we think of Greece, we think of Constantinople, Asia Minor, but the majority of the icons that survive from before the 6th, 7th century are actually found in places like Western Europe, in Rome, in Sicily. Holy Mount Athos, these, these monks are there, and all of a sudden they look out to sea and they see this light coming down from the heavens, illuminating this icon that's riding the waves upright. And one of the, the monks, in his humility and his reverence and his love for the Theotokos, uh, wants to go rescue it so it doesn't sink. And without even realizing it, he runs across the water. He kneels, he picks it up, and he carries it to shore. And there the rest of the monks see it, they reverence it, they receive it into the monastery. It's called the Porta Itisa. She's the keeper of the doors, of the gate. And the way that it got this, this name is really a neat story. The monks, of course, this miracle-working icon that came to them riding upon the waves, they decide to bring into the church, the holiest of places. So they bring it into the altar. The next day, the monks wake up, go to the church early in the morning, and it's gone. It's not there. And one of them, like, hey, it's out here. They look, and it's hanging next to the gate leading to the monastery. The soldier attacked the icon. He struck it with his sword, 
and you still see the wound. And it's not real clear. It's hard to find an image that's clear. You can see the cut, the gash on her cheek. But the moment that the sword cut her cheek, blood began to gush out. And, and that's why you see him tearing off his turban, throwing down his sword, kneeling in repentance, having recognized that this truly is the mother of God. And, and if, when you see it really in light, you can still see that the, the wood itself has been stained red. This miracle-working icon uh, that's on the holy mountain, uh, a monk appears to one of the monks there, and the monk is actually Archangel Gabriel in disguise. And the archangel basically says, you know how you say that, that beautiful hymn, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, Without corruption, you gave birth to God the Word. We magnify you the truth, Theotokos. You're missing part of it. The preface, right? Worthy are you, mother of God. Oxyonistin. It's another of the famous Athenite miracle-working icons. Uh, You'll notice that somewhat uniquely, Christ is placing his hand over the mouth of his mother. The, the monks had gotten pretty lazy, right? They had left the world to pray, to struggle, to suffer on behalf of all humanity, and they ended up just kind of turning it into like this resort vacation. They weren't doing their prayers, they weren't giving hospitality, they were basically doing everything wrong. And so these monasteries, huge, almost like castles, they have walls around them. They'd never, you know, bother with closing the gates. Well, as was not uncommon in the time period, there were Turkish pirates. There were Muslim pirates that would often come and they raid the monasteries. And the abbot was in church. And he hears a woman's voice say, go close the gates. And he goes and he looks at the icon. And this icon that had been like any ordinary icon with Christ, his hands folded, the Theotokos, he sees this image. And the Theotokos was saying to go close the gates. And Christ says to his mother, trying to cover her mouth, they are not worthy to be saved. This is uh, an icon of an event with a famous icon, right? So this is St. John of Damascus. St. John of Damascus, uh, we know as one of the great theologians, one of the great teachers of our church. For the most part, he was spoken ill of by certain people. He was a servant in the court of uh, a Muslim caliph, actually. And the, the Muslim decided to punish him by cutting off his hand. So his hand is cut off, like St. Maximus, his father, mentioned in the sermon today. And what does St. John of Damascus do? He doesn't run to the doctor. He doesn't try to cauterize the wound. He runs to the church, and he takes the stump of his hand and a severed hand, and he holds it up against her icon. And he tells her, it was in your defense It was out of my love for you that this has happened. Fix it. And sure enough, as he's praying, the blood's gushing out. He falls asleep, he passes out, and when he wakes up in the morning, his hand has been healed. This one, you you may notice the the, it's a little bit different. This is a a miracle-working icon of the Theotokos from the nation of Georgia, not the state, the country. Here's one that is perhaps even more distinct. This is a, an Ethiopian icon of the Theotokos with the child. This is a, a very special icon. This is the icon of the Theotokos at Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom. This is the icon of the Theotokos at the Protaton, which is the main church of the Holy Mountain. This is one of the, the more famous icons. This is the icon of the Mother of God of Vladimir, uh, often associated with Russia. But it was actually, it was a Byzantine icon that was gifted to a Russian prince. So this icon is another relatively common icon, uh, but there's kind of a neat story behind it. If you notice, and it's not real clear in this image, it's an older one, but you have two angels. And these angels, one of the angels is holding a cross, and one of the angels is holding a, a silver tray that has a crown of thorns and nails. And the story goes that the angels came to Christ when he was a little, when he was a toddler, and showed him the cross and the nails and the crown. This is why you've come, 
Here we have uh, an early acoustic. So we talked about last time acoustic. It's, it's a way of uh, painting using dyed beeswax. Uh, this is a 5th century icon of the Theotokos, an early one, that acoustic tradition from Mount Sinai. Many of these miracle working icons actually have icons of them uh, that, that show the story of it. So here we have a, a miracle working icon of uh, the Theotokos. This is another one of uh, my favorite icons of the Theotokos. Uh, this is called the icon of the Theotokos of the inexhaustible cup. So this is a copy of the miracle working icon. So this is the Vimatisisa. This is a miracle working icon. Uh, and you may have heard there was recently a copy of it that was gifted from the monastery of Atopedi to our own metropolis. And it's uh, a copy of this, and it's really a duplicate of this icon, dimension, size, everything, uh, and was blessed over this icon at uh, St. Stephen's camp at the Diakonia Center. This is... Uh, icon that is from uh, the monastery of Xenofondos, uh, a monastery that I actually had the, the privilege of staying at three to four weeks. This is the icon of the Theotokos of Jerusalem. And this is one of the, the icons that uh, was not painted by hand, right? was gifted in a sense by the Theotokos to the world. Um, what's really neat about this icon, and I have a, kind of a connection to it, is when I was on the holy mountain, I had the, the great blessing to visit the keli, the cell of St. Paisios, uh, a contemporary saint of our church who just, he died in 1994. So a very modern saint of the church. And uh, I came to his hut, and uh, one of the monks there opened it up to me, and they've, they've preserved it exactly the way that he left it, to the point that his sweater is still hanging over the arm of the, the place where he would stand. And uh, within the, the cell, there was a living room where he had his bed, his food, and everything. There was a, a workplace. He was a carpenter. Uh, when he was a young monk, he said, I'll never become like Christ in virtue, but at least I can be a carpenter. A little photograph of this icon was in the corner of the icon of the Theotokos on the iconostas. And I don't remember if I asked or if the monk asked me if I knew what that was. I said no. And uh, he says, well... The Blessed Yeronda tells us that of all the icons he'd ever seen, this is the one that most accurately depicts the Theotokos. This is an icon of uh, the Theotokos of the life-giving font. As you can see, she's fit sitting in a, a fountain. Uh, this is, uh, there was a fountain discovered outside of Constantinople called Zodokos Pigi, a life-giving font. Uh, a very, very famous church that had a, a spring that had miraculous working water that came from it. Uh, and this is an icon depicting it uh, and reminding us that Christ, the living water that gives life to all of us and immortality to all of us, uh, came forth from the Theotokos as water from a font. This is another one of my favorite icons. Uh, I suppose I've said that about all of them by now. But uh, this is an icon that shows Christ nursing. Right? He's, he's actually nursing. Uh, this is a, a miracle working icon at the monastery of Xenophondos. And it, it, one, one of the reasons I love it so much is in one of the hymns that we chant at the Paraclesi service during the first two weeks of August, uh, exactly, we, this hymn addressed to the Theotokos, how is it that you nurse the Savior? This is a, another common image of the Theotokos. This one's referred to as glycophilusa, or the sweet kiss. And it shows Christ kissing Panagia on the cheek. This is Yaya Zoni, uh, or belt, or sash. Uh, the monastery of another uh, thing that the monastery of Vatopedi has is it has the sash, the belt that the Theotokos wore. And this is an icon of her holding the sash. These next icons are just some uh, different icons, different iconographic styles. Again, uh, as I'm, to build off of what I said the last time, uh, this attempt to try to find uh, a modern vocabulary. How do we express, how do we incarnate our tradition of iconography in our contemporary United States? This is a, 
a beautiful icon. This actually is an icon. Father spoke of Akrata Pinosis. This is a version of the icon. And uh, what I love about this icon is it, it sort of is a reversal of that glycophilosa or that Karadoitisa. This is the Theotokos of the burning bush. Of course, here's Moses taking his sandals off. This is holy ground. Uh, we know from the Akathis in the early church that this, this bush that was burning but remained unconsumed was understood as an image or a foreshadowing of the Virgin Mary. Um, the graffiti, the chipping away at these images, uh, these are churches that belonged to Christians. The, the Christian people had to flee and uh, the Muslims would go in, uh, take knives to the image, slice the image, leave graffiti on it. This is a, a special icon to me. This is uh, the Theotokos Riverview. Uh, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and this is downtown St. Paul. And uh, it shows the bridges going across. This area here is called the West Side, uh, which is where I was raised. Icon of the Theotokos. Uh, we have here an image. You know, the 20th century was really the most violent century for Christians. Millions of Christians lost their lives in the gulags of the Soviet Russia, uh, prison camps in Romania. This brings us to probably my favorite icon. Wait, I've said that already. Mother Maria uh, of Paris. She was a nun that came from Russia. Uh, she was part of that emigre that found safety in Paris, uh, in large part because of the persecution of the Soviets. Many people fled and found themselves in Paris. Uh, there she was a nun. She ministered to the poor, to the needy, to the addicts, to the drunkards, to the elderly, to the homeless. The reality of the 20th century as well as giving us some comfort, right? The, the 20th century, we see this mechanization of death. We see two world wars. We see the, the Soviet Union. We see the persecution of the churches that has continued to this day. And this icon realizes us that we do not suffer alone. But Christ did and does and will suffer with us. And that in that, our suffering is redeemed and we have the resurrection.